Hi, my name is Adriana Peterson. I'm a professional career counselor. I have a master's in science and counseling and student affairs. And the majority of my experience has been in career development within the college and university setting. This is an online workshop that describes on ways you can be successful when preparing for a career fair. So why attend a career fair? Well, it's a great way to find jobs and internships. Of course, you want to apply online, go to other events, use your network to help you find a job, but meeting people face to face in this digital world really is a golden opportunity. It's also a great way to practice your networking skills. You know, meeting people that you don't know for the first time, striking up a conversation, selling yourself as a professional, that's not always the easiest thing for everyone to do. But networking is a skill, and just like most skills, it can be developed in time with a little practice. The more practice you have, the more confident you will feel. It's also a great way to discover tips and trends within your job search. So asking ind industry professionals what they're looking for in a candidate, you know, what are some current trends in hiring, that would be a great way uh, for you to better your job search. The topics that we're going to cover in this presentation are going to be organized in the following ways. First, we're going to talk about things that you can do before the fair to prepare. That's going to be a large portion of this presentation. We're also going to talk about things you can do during the fair to be successful. And then finally, ways you can follow up uh, with employers after the fair. The topics we're going to cover to discuss what you can do before the career fair will include making sure that you have professional business attire, having your resume reviewed by a professional, practicing your elevator pitch, maybe consider creating a LinkedIn profile, and then researching the companies that are going to be in attendance before the fair. Just like an interview, you want to make sure that you're coming to the career fair in business professional attire. What that means for men is you would dress in matching jacket and slacks, having a tie, a button-down shirt with collar, dress shoes that are polished and clean, and clean hair and combed hair. I want to just touch upon a facial hair for just a moment. If you have a full beard, that's okay. Maybe consider if that beard could use a little trim to make it look less wild. If you're clean shaven, that's okay too. But what you want to avoid is the halfway look to where you look a little scruffy and unkempt. Just ask yourself, should I go for the full beard or should I trim it down to a clean shave? Women, on the other hand, have a little more flexibility in their fashion. They can wear a slacks and a jacket, just like, like a man but um, they can also wear a skirt. I do recommend that the skirt not go above the knee. Try not to have your skirt too short. You'll also include a blouse, but try not to have the blouse too low cut or maybe too vibrant. You want to err on the side of conservative. That's usually um, a safe place. Um, wearing natural conservative makeup and maybe not something that's too loud or too vibrant that might be more appropriate for a night out at a bar or a club. Come in dress shoes. Some people have it in mind that you have to wear heels, but that's not always the case. If you are comfortable in heels, feel free to wear them. Uh, but flats are okay too. As long as they look professional, that is all right. Um, you wanna come in where it being comfortable and you don't want to be too sidetracked by your feet hurting when you should be more focused on selling yourself as a professional. If you choose to wear a skirt, I do recommend wearing pantyhose. This is just a little tip because some people think that the naked leg um, it is a little too raw. So maybe consider wearing a pantyhose to look a little more polished. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money on business attire. There's plenty of affordable places to find um, business attire. That could be Walmart, it could be Target, it could be a TJ Maxx, it could be a Marshalls. Um, there should be a lot of options for you to consider. This slide will give you a visual of what we just discussed um, and showing the difference between business professional and business casual. Anytime you're going to a interview or career fair, dress in business professional attire. If you happen to go into an interview or to a career fair, you notice that everyone is more business casual. 
just know that that's what you're going to wear for your interview and every day after that you would wear uh, what is normal for the workplace if that is business casual or maybe even casual if you're ever in a situation where you go into a room and you realize wow i'm in business pro business professional attire and i am way overdressed what you can do is simply take off your jacket and you're immediately business casual Before you attend a career fair, it's very important that you have your resume reviewed by a professional. That way you are showcasing yourself in the very best light you can for the jobs that you're seeking. So what is a resume? It's a document that showcases your skills, experiences, education, attributes, achievements, certifications that relate to the positions that you're applying to. Please know that a good resume should have focused and it should be tailored to the jobs you are pursuing. A, a weak resume would be a very general resume written for anything. So some tips to keep in mind, uh, most people who are a typical college age student with that type of experience usually should have a one page resume. You could have a two page resume if you can justify the second page with experience related to your field. For an example, a lot of teaching students, after they finish their practicum and they're involved in their student, student teaching, they could have a two-page resume, perhaps. But what you want to avoid is having one page and a little bit on the next. You should have either a one full page or a two full page resume. Try to use an easy to read font style. Avoid anything that looks very cursive-like and might be difficult to read. Now, what you can do for your font size, your name should be the most largest, most predominant thing on your resume. Usually, I recommend between 18 to 20 point font size. If you would like your section headers to be larger, that can be a little bit larger too. But for the rest of your content, 12 point font size is pretty standard. You can go down as low as 11. And that might save you some room if you're looking to push everything to one page. Some people say 10 is okay. In my opinion, I think 10 is a little hard on the eyes. One inch margins is also another way um, that you can um, keep your resume to one page. One inch margins is pretty standard, but you can go down as low as 0.60 and that might save some room. If you go down to 0.50, that might be okay, but you might also run into some printing issues and errors. Definitely use a bullet point formatting. Back in the day, we used to use narrative formatting, like writing in sentences. That way you could showcase your writing skills and talk about your experience. That is no longer the case. Employers spend seconds looking at your resume for the first time and making sure that it's very easy to read, very scannable, and learning how to create a strong bullet point is very important. Now, when you're listing your experience within each section, you want to use a reverse chronological order. So within that section, the most recent experience on top and going down to the oldest on the bottom. You also want to be very consistent with your formatting. Whatever you choose to adopt, please stick with it. For an example, if you decide you want to have your dates justified to the right, make sure that all your dates fall to the right and just are justified to the margin. If you decide to list your experience with your job title first, or bold it for an example, make sure you do that for each, each position. Don't change up the formatting because then it becomes harder to read. If you decide to go to the career fair and you were, want to bring your resume with you, which I highly recommend, um, don't print it on regular printer paper, print it on resume paper. Resume paper is a little bit different than regular printer paper. It's more stylized, and you can find different versions at a FedEx office, um, Office Depot, or, or you can even go to the office section of a Walmart or a Target, and they might have a couple of different options. Templates are good, in my opinion, for when you have never created a resume before and you need a little bit of guidance. There are a lot of templates out there out on internet land. Some are good, some are outdated, some might not be appropriate for where you are in your educational and, and career pursuit, and some are just really difficult to edit. So if you find a template that you like, 
uh, go ahead and incorporate it, um, use it, but then take it to a professional and see what they say, because there might be a different way to organize your information um, that to showcase yourself in a better way. And again, resumes should be focused to the positions that you're applying to. That can include looking through the job description, seeing what keywords and skills that are being used, and having those words incorporated within your resume. A lot of businesses are now adopting something called ATS, Applicant Tracking Software. And that is a software that scans resumes and filters people out, good candidates from bad candidates, before they even reach a real person. So a good way to beat that system is to try to use the words that are found on the position description. This doesn't mean you're gonna to have to rewrite your resume every single time for every position that you apply to, but it does mean that there should be some tweaking involved. Uh, to continue on with resumes, um, I'm gonna talk about some um, common mistakes that's often used. What you wanna avoid using are personal pronouns within your resume. Um, no I, my, we, our, they. Um, it's gonna sound very objective within your bullet points. So instead of saying, I created, I developed, I managed, just start off with a strong action word, managed, analyzed, developed. Um, what you also wanna do, obviously, is avoid uh, spelling errors. There's also no need to list references upon request at the bottom of your resume. A lot of resume templates out there will have that immediately placed at the bottom. But if an employer is asking for references, they'll let you know. They'll probably even let you know how many or even what kind, professional, personal, or maybe even a mix between the two. So it's just not really needed to list it at the bottom. It's just known as kind of a waste of space. Um, also listing your education at the bottom. There are a lot of templates that will force your education towards the bottom, and that would be appropriate for people who have lots of experience within their field. When you're writing a resume, you want to list your sections in the order of what is most important. Most important towards the top, least important sections towards the bottom. And if you are a current or, or a recent college graduate, um, you know, typical age college student, what's probably going to speak most about you professionally is going to be your education. So you want that towards the top of your resume versus towards the bottom. If you have 10 plus years of experience within your field, then having it at the bottom would be okay in that case. You also want to avoid using photographs in your resume. Unless you're a theater arts student, then you're going to have a professional headshot that would be used to apply for those types of jobs. But for most people, having a photograph is not necessary for your resume. Um, you also want to avoid you talking about hobbies, religion, politics. Just avoid those topics because that is not what is appropriate for a resume. Some people still use objectives. It's my professional opinion that objectives are a little outdated. What the objective is, is a quick, you know, one-line statement that says, what type of jobs are you seeking? And it's kind of a given if you're applying for their job, they kind of know your objective is to get their job. What has become um, increasingly popular is replacing the objective with something called a professional profile or a summary or a summary of qualifications. And the difference between the two is an objective is what do you hope to get from the employer? A summary or a profile is what do you have to offer? If they weren't going to read through your, your, your resume, what, how would you describe yourself with the three to four lines on your resume? It is a summary of your skills, experiences, and attributes that relate directly to the position you're applying to. It's you in a snapshot. So, you know, if you have an, an objective on your resume, it's not going to like make or break you, but it's just kind of becoming known as, as a waste of space, just kind of redundant. Um, you also want to avoid using what we call absolute language because that might oversell yourself, especially if you don't have a lot of related experience. So if you try to say that you're an expert in something or that you mastered something um, or perfected something, they, that, that might be a little too strong. Uh, try you dialing back that language a little bit. 
Another thing you might want to consider working on before the career fair is developing your elevator pitch. When you get that very common, tell me about yourself question that can be found in an interview or in a career fair situation, just know that that is a trigger for what we call your elevator pitch. And what an elevator pitch is, is it's a clear and concise 30 second description of who you are professionally, not personally. It includes your education, your experience, maybe some transferable or related skills or attributes, maybe even achievements, and then professional goals for the future. And always focusing on goals that would be in line with the type of jobs that you're applying to. One thing you might want to consider is you may have a different pitch depending on your situation. For an example, myself, I have my own pitch when I am selling myself as a professional in interviews. Um, and then I have a different pitch that I use when I'm networking in, with employers as part of my job. Um, so my point there, my, my intent there is to not sell myself, but to sell uh, students and, and hoping that uh, employers will be more involved with our university. Then I also have another pitch for when I am talking with students and encouraging them to use my services. So just know that your elevator pitch may change based on your audience. An elevator pitch will answer the following questions. Who are you? What are you studying? What is your general experience? And what kind of experience or positions are you looking for? And then show them they've done your research. Ask a good question. I've included a template to help you develop an elevator pitch if you think it is helpful. It can go in the following format. Hello, my name is. I'm majoring in with a concentration in. I have experience in. And I'm hoping to find a position that will allow me to. I've researched your company and I heard you do blank. Can you tell me more about that? So for an example, hi, my name is Jeff Davis and I'm majoring in business with a concentration in marketing. I have experience in sales and customer service within the hospitality industry, and I'm looking for an internship that will allow me to gain a deeper understanding of the sports marketing industry. I researched your company and I see you have a leadership training program. Can you tell me more about that? Here are some other examples that you could consider if it gives you a little more clarity on what an elevator pitch is. Uh, feel free to just pause this uh, slide and then read through it yourself if you find it helpful. Another thing you can do before the fair is create a LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn is the largest social media website used for pro professional networking. And it's used by all kinds of people, students, professionals of all kinds, people who are looking to sell their services or doing research. Um, it's used by so many different people, and it can be used for job searching or connecting with individuals within your field or talent recruiting. A lot of recruiters are found on LinkedIn and often look for what we call passive candidates. Candidates that are not actively searching for jobs, but they're out on LinkedIn and the recruiters are looking for them. A new member joins LinkedIn every two seconds. Who's viewed your profile remains the number one favorite feature. So unlike other social media websites like Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat, know that there is a setting that when you go to visit someone's profile, they can see who has clicked on their page. Um, know that posting once a week to your newsfeed makes you 10 times more likely to be contacted by a recruiter. Staying visible is important. 95% of surveyed HR professionals indicated that you, they use LinkedIn to recruit, again, passive candidates. So why should you create a LinkedIn profile? Well, it allows you to have a professional online presence. If employers are looking to hire you, chances are they're going to Google search you. And it's really great if you can have a professional profile that lands to the top of your search. And unlike your resume, you're not limited to just one page. If you would like to go into more detail on your LinkedIn profile, including a picture, a longer summary, you can even use it as an online portfolio to showcase the work that you've done that relates to the jobs that you apply to. 
even if you're not actively using LinkedIn, you're not posting every day, you're not joining groups or connecting with people, if you're not that engaged, in the very least, have a strong professional profile created because this allows recruiters to find you. It can also act as a contact management system. So this can be helpful in all your networking. So let's say you go to that career fair and you collect some cards and want to keep in touch with people. Go on that night or the next day and find that person. If they're out recruiting at a career fair, they're most likely going to be on LinkedIn. Connect with them, send them a message, say, hello, Mr. and Ms. So-and-so, it was a pleasure to meet you yesterday at Blank Career Fair. Um, I really enjoyed learning more about your company. I would like to stay in touch. Would you please consider adding me to your network? Go ahead and send that message because if they spoke to a lot of people the day before, you want to refresh their memory of who they spoke to and where you met. This is also a great way for people to endorse your skills and write you online recommendations. Know that it goes against etiquette to post and ask for endorsements and ask for registry uh, recommendations. The easiest way to get your skills endorsed is to endorse others and then they will feel the need to reciprocate. It's also a great way to stay current with the trends within your field. So there's an opportunity to join groups and view discussions. So if you want to know more about what's going on, uh, stay up to date, learn what's going on in the, in the job search and trends, join those groups and look at those conversations and that can be very helpful. So here are some helpful tips um, that you can consider when creating your profile. You can use your polished professional resume as a base for creating your LinkedIn profile. So when you go to create your experience section and your education section, you can copy and po uh, paste your bullet points from your resume into your LinkedIn profile. This might sound redundant, but in actuality, consistency is good. Because if your resume looked quite different from your LinkedIn profile, which looked different from a cover letter, etc., um, it's going to ca cause what we call brand confusion. So consistency is good. Also, when you go to create a strong headline and summary, know that the summary on your LinkedIn profile is different from a summary that you find on a resume. <laughs> the summary on your resume is usually no longer than four lines. It's pretty short and sweet. The one on your LinkedIn profile can definitely be more conversational and you can use those personal pronouns. Go into more detail about yourself and what are your passions and what are your goals for the future. A strong headline would be focused towards the jobs that you are applying to, trying to include words that would be very searchable for employers. Often when uh, recruiters are looking for candidates, they often search through the head headline, through the summary, or a general search for keywords within your profile when finding candidates. As far as your privacy settings go and your account settings, there are some recommendations that I would like to give. Uh, say no to sharing profile edits. And if you look at the slide, I've included a pathway on how to do that. Basically, anytime you edit your profile, whether that's um, adding a new position or experience, what happens is it sends an email notification out to everyone in your network saying, hey, check out so-and-so's new job. Congratulate so-and-so on their um, you know, fifth year at their job. I say no to these because it's kind of annoying to your network. Also, if you're planning on doing a job change and you decide to overhaul your profile and your employer or your boss happens to be a connection on your profile and all of a sudden they get a bunch of notifications that you're revamping your page, that could be a red flag to them. How likely is that going to happen? Not too likely, but in the very least, turn off those sharing profile edits because it's annoying. You want to let recruiters know that you are open to opportunities and that's the pathway to do so. So this lets recruiters know that you are a current job seeker. If you are, turn that on and say yes to that. If you would like to include your URL, your link to your LinkedIn profile on your resume, you can do that within your header. But you want to customize your URL. When you get a URL by default from LinkedIn, 
it'll come with your first name, last name, and then like letter number, letter number, letter number at the end. It ends up being very awkward and it doesn't look very clean. So if you want to customize your URL and get rid of that default, maybe just change it to your first name or last name if possible. That's the pathway on how to do that. Also, put in the time to make it awesome. You know, the better, the stronger the profile you have, the more likely you are going to be seen as a desirable candidate for employers. A very important thing that you should do uh, before the fair is to research the companies that are going to be in attendance. And this will help you decide who do you want to talk to first. Always try to focus on hitting the people that are most important to you, that you want to make sure you get to talk to first, just in case they get busy and the hustle and bustle of the career fair. You want to talk to the people who are most important and then go out to explore the other companies as well. This will also let you know maybe what kind of positions they're looking for. Um, and researching the company will allow you to ask really good questions. Um, and it's also going to allow you to stand out amongst your peers. Not everybody takes the time to do this. So when you go in looking knowledgeable and intentful and having done your research, you're going to stand out about amongst the others. Now we're going to move on to what you can do during the career fair, at the career fair, to help yourself be more successful. One thing is, don't come too late. You want to make sure that you have enough time to talk to the employers that you want to speak to. And if the fair ends up being a little slow, sometimes employers pack up a little bit early. So you want to make sure you're not coming too late. Also come dressed to impress. Make sure you are wearing your business professional attire. Bring multiple copies of your resume on resume paper ready to hand out. If you have a padfolio, that's really helpful. That way you can keep extra copies with you and also have a pad of paper and a pen to where you can take notes and keep your cards collected. Just know, don't try to take up too much of their time. Just be aware of some verbal and nonverbal cues in which they need to move on to the next candidate. And definitely use your pitch. This is your time to shine. Definitely talk about yourself and your professional offerings, but don't forget to talk about them and ask good questions. And of course, ask for their business card. That way you can follow up with them if, and follow their instructions on how to do so. Connecting with them on LinkedIn is great, but if they say email me your resume or apply online, follow their directions. Take notes as needed on how to apply, names, deadlines, etc. What's really important is that you be yourself. Don't try to put on a show. Be your professional self, but be your authentic self. And uh, people can tell, they speak to, a, employers speak to a lot of different people, a lot of different students, um, and they can kind of tell when people are putting on a show. Just be you. Smile and be polite and be friendly to everyone. And that includes people in the parking lot, and other people who are attending the career fair. You definitely do not want to see an employer see you get into some kind of uh, confrontation or argument with someone during the career fair because that will almost guarantee you that your chances for that job are eliminated. So here are some example questions that you can ask during the career fair. Of course, you want to have your questions be specific to the company so you show them that you've done your research. But generally speaking, what are some good questions? You can ask, what is it like to work for your company? What skills are you looking for in a candidate? Um, what do you see as being the biggest challenge of this position? And how do I formally apply? Or maybe describe what the company culture looks like. These are just some examples of questions that you can ask employers during the career fair. Also after the career fair, since you've already created your LinkedIn profile, you can then connect with employers and try to do that within 24 hours of the fair so you might be still fresh in their memory. This is kind of an example on how you can connect and how to compose a message um, sent to employers. After the fair, uh, you're going to want to follow the employer's directions on what are the next steps. That might include 
um, applying online, or it might be sending them an email directly. If you've applied for a position and you don't hear back from them within a week or two, you can send a brief follow-up email or place a phone call inquiring about their status search. So what you can do is call the employer or send a follow-up email to your contact and say, Hi, Mr. or Ms. So-and-so. Um, I recently applied for a blank position and I'm just inquiring where you might be in your search status. Um, when would, do you think you might be contacting people for interviews? And just leave it at that. Another thing you can do after the fair is reflect upon your fair experience. What went well? And what would you maybe do differently next time? That way you can be more successful um, in the next time you decide to attend a career fair. And just know, again, while career fairs are a great way to find jobs, not everyone will leave with a job prospect. In the very least, career fairs are a safe place to practice your networking skills. So this concludes our online workshop on how to prepare for a career fair. We've covered a lot of information in a short time, so if you have any additional questions about res resume writing, LinkedIn, developing an elevator pitch, please contact your career advisor and make an appointment. Thank you very much for listening. I really hope that you found this information helpful and that you can use it in your job search in the future. I've also included a quiz at the very end of this presentation, the very last slide, to assess your knowledge um, if you like. So thank you so much for listening again, um, and I wish you well in your job search.